All right, it's six o'clock, so we'll get started. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's presentation, Food Regulations in Shared Use Kitchens. This is made possible by Rural Action's USDA Beginning Farmer and Rancher Grant, and it's part of the whole farm planning series put on by Rural Action. Tonight's presenter is Adam Cody, ACENET's Food Enterprise Coordinator, and we're joined tonight by Rural Action's Katie Lloyd, Beginning Farmer Outreach Assistant, and Tom Redfern, Sustainable Agriculture Director. Katie and Tom, would you like to say hey, a couple words about Rural Action before we get started and Adam takes over? I can go ahead. Um, as Bailey said, I am the Beginning Farmer Outreach Assistant at Rural Action. Rural Action is a 31-year-old membership-based community development organization with a 21-county footprint focused on building a more just economy by uh, building up the region's assets. Uh, so this uh, webinar is an example of that. We're providing uh, resources to local farmers and producers specifically for this webinar on food regulations and value added food production. So I'd just like to thank ACENET for being here and putting this on. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks Katie and thanks Bailey and Adam and Big thanks to our longtime partnership with the longtime partnership with the Athens Center for Economic Networks, ACENET, our great partner. All right, Adam, take it away. Okay, thank you, Bailey. <clears throat> thank you, Katie. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you, Rural Action, for hosting this event, and thank you, everyone that is here attending this webinar. And anyone that is going to listen to it in the future, this will be recorded and will be kind of shot out across the social media sphere. So we're very excited about that. And speaking of excited, we got an exciting topic here tonight, which is food regulations. Okay. Um, and also we're going to talk, we're going to touch on shared use kitchens as well. That's kind of our bread and butter and my bread and butter at ACENET, um, kind of some of the values of shared use kitchens uh, and how they can help you uh, on your value added uh, product journey. Okay, so just to introduce myself and tell you a little bit more about me. Uh, my name is Adam and my title is Food Enterprise Coordinator uh, at the Appalachian Center for Economic Networks, otherwise known as ACENET. I have a number, getting some echo or feedback from somebody. Um, Okay, because so that went away. Uh, but I have a number of certifications in the realms of both food safety and food processing, uh, including better process controls, uh, HACCP, uh, preventive controls, and serve safe. Uh, and my role at ACENET is to assist all of our food entrepreneurs um, with everything they need in terms of uh, the initial intake process, uh, product development, regulatory assistance is a big piece of that, uh, but basically getting them from point A to point Z. Uh, getting them in the, into production in our kitchen uh, or beyond, uh, and then helping them all the way kind of uh, along that, what can be a very long process. Um, so that's what I do at ACENET. And in that position, uh, I have found myself, you know, asking a lot of the questions that we're going to go over here uh, this evening. Okay. So what I, what I always like to do at the beginning of this conversation um, is touch on some of the why of the why the house. So the first question uh, that you might have as a business owner is, uh, especially if you are already raising produce or doing something that is supporting your business is, you know, what's the purpose of value adding? Why should I do it? What does it do for my business and my product line? Okay. So the first thing that I always like to say is that value adding, um, value added processing farmers, the potential to capture a larger share of the food dollar. So the key word here is value, right? We're adding value to something that already exists. Uh, by patch it, packaging it into something that a client or a customer uh, would find more value in. All right, a couple of statistics, one statistic that I have here for you uh, is that the farmer's share of consumers' food shopping dollar has decreased from 46% in 1913 to just fewer than 20% in 2006. That's actually an outdated number. I would say it's probably even lower than that at this point, um, according to the USDA Economic Research Service. Um, so this is greater proof that, you know, as, as farmers, as producers, um, it's important to diversify and find new ways to capture consumer dollars. Uh, and all the trends are pointed and continue to point now for many years on consumers buying more ready to eat 
or ready to cook foods uh, while farmers generally produce and market raw agricultural commodities, right? So trying to figure out the best way to capture some more of those dollars is really the biggest reason to look into value adding. So a definition, what is USDA's definition of value adding for food specifically? So USDA says that a change in the physical state or form of the product, such as milling wheat into flour, making strawberries into jam, the production of a product in a manner that enhances its value as demonstrated through a business plan, such as organically produced products. So there's really two different kind of means of getting there, means of adding value. Uh, it could be changing the physical state, uh, it could be making an organic product, um, or a combination, a combination of the two. So there we have a little bit of a definition to back up this conversation. Now, the next question we get to is how do we do it? How do we value add? Well, there's a lot of different ways. Okay, I will preempt these next few slides by saying that um, there are multiple ways to do it, uh, but minimal processing and packaging is generally the sort of lowest hanging fruit, okay, the easiest path to get there. Uh, what I mean by that when I say minimal processing and packaging uh, is that there are few processing steps involved. It's usually not a very labor intensive process. Uh, the majority of the value is added through convenience uh, for the consumer and appealing packaging. Okay, so we're trying to find a way to just make it more appealing or convenient for a consumer to purchase and use. Uh, generally involves just one ingredient, right? It's a head of lettuce, right? It's something like that, uh, or maybe even fewer ingredients. Uh, and then some examples that I give here are, you know, you cut up and you package some of the fruits or vegetables that you have grown for easy cooking, right? We've all been in the grocery store and we've seen the pre-diced onions and the cut up pineapple and things like that. Um, those are value-added products, right? They're taking a raw agricultural commodity. Uh, they are processing it. They're putting it into a package for the consumer uh, to use without any additional work. Okay, what about intensive processing and packaging? So this is like the next step if you want to go above and beyond. Um, more often than not, there are several or many processing steps involved. Uh, the majority of the value is added through processing ingredients into a ready-to-eat food product, okay? Uh, generally involves multiple ingredients. Uh, so maybe you are growing tomatoes, right? But there's a lot of stuff that has to be added to those tomatoes to make something like, in the example that I give here, a salsa, right? Or a pasta sauce. Um, could also be something like pesto that is made from your basil, jams or jellies that are made from berries or fruit. Okay, so this is again, taking that raw agricultural commodity, uh, but doing some kind of more intensive process, something that might require uh, more equipment, uh, might require more labor, packaging, uh, and maybe even some uh, regulatory assistance to get to the finish line. So the next question here is where can I make these products? Uh, so there's a variety of options to answer this question as well. Uh, now, the first thing that uh, comes to mind for a lot of producers who are just starting out uh, is, can I make this at home? Can I make this at home? And the answer is maybe, depending on what it is, okay? Uh, so a cottage food operation uh, is in Ohio, it's in many states, when they say cottage foods, what we're referring to as products that are made in the home. Uh, they, are being, they are exempt from being licensed and inspected for the production of cottage foods, okay? So in Ohio, Cottage foods includes non-potentially hazardous foods like bakery products, jams, jellies, candy, fruit butter, and similar products that are specified in rules. Okay, so there is an actual list of items, and it might even be the next slide here momentarily. I'll show you what that list looks like. We're not going to go over over everything. Um, but no matter what state you are processing in or you're looking to do cottage food production in, uh, chances are that there is a cottage food law that specifically spells out what foods do and do not fall under cottage foods. And it does vary greatly between states. For example, here in Ohio, we cannot do any kind of acidified or jarred foods as a cottage food. In West Virginia, right across the river, you absolutely can. Okay, so it's very state to state. Um, the key here, as far as the label, and we'll touch more on labeling at the end of the presentation here today, uh, the label must include the statement, this product is home produced. All right, there is another series of requirements on that label as well, but the key statement for any cottage food is the label must include the statement, this product is home produced. All right, here's that list. Again, I'm going to go over it, but 
this is the kind of thing you can expect to see uh, depending on the state that you're in, where you'll have a list of kind of allowed items uh, that are allowed under the cottage food in Ohio rule, uh, and then a list also of not allowed items. Um, the allowed items list, as you can see at the top, is the full list, right? So it's got to be one of those items. If it's not on that list, you're not going to make be able to make it at home. Uh, the not allowed says examples, not all inclusive, right? So it doesn't cover every single possible thing that you can think of, uh, but it does uh, spell out ones that I'm sure have come up and been common requests for people who want to make something at home. Uh, or people have been making these things at home, they get caught, they get busted, and they get sent to ASNET to go make them. That's just something that happens a lot, actually. Uh, someone doesn't realize that, hey, I can't make this at home. Uh, and the Department of Ag or the Department of Health will say, well, go to, this, go to a shared use kitchen and you can make it there. So let's say that we want to make a product that is not allowed uh, there's not a cottage food, uh, or we're just looking for greater production potential, greater production possibilities. Uh, where would we look in that case? Well, we look for a, a licensed commercial kitchen, okay? Uh, so a licensed commercial kitchen is a facility that is inspected uh, by local, state, and or federal regulatory agencies. Uh, the level of oversight basically determines what types of processing can and cannot occur at specific facilities. So some examples of licensed commercial kitchens include church, uh, school or community center kitchens, restaurant kitchens, a uh, shared use kitchen like ACENET. Uh, these are all licensed commercial kitchens. They just might not all be licensed by the same um, regulatory body, okay? So what are some uh, very simple benefits to working in a commercial kitchen? Number one, licensing. This is what we've been talking about, right? Uh, so many products cannot be made under cottage food law due to their hazardous potential. Uh, these commercial kitchens are going to meet some of the regulatory standards uh, to accommodate, accommodate production of those items uh, that are not covered by cottage foods. Again, not every commercial kitchen is going to be, uh, you're not going to roll in there and just start making anything day one, uh, right? They're usually set up uh, for a, a number of different products. Uh, some of it uh, is the regulatory component, yes, but there's also equipment concerns, there's spacing, uh, there's, there's a lot to look at. But from a licensing perspective, um, commercial kitchens are going to meet regulatory standards uh, to accommodate the production of items that are not covered by cottage foods. Okay, now the next thing, and one of the most obvious benefits is equipment, okay? Uh, so access to commercial equipment an infrastructure that may otherwise be financially uh, inaccessible, right? Anybody who's worked in a commercial kitchen or spent time in one or has looked into buying any of this stuff knows that it's really expensive. It's really expensive to purchase. It's really expensive to maintain. Um, and you, you are making a pretty significant financial investment uh, if you're looking to purchase those items yourself. So uh, you are able to offset a significant cost uh, by renting or having access to a space that already has those things in place. Uh, and then as we know, better equipment uh, should lead to both increased efficiency and increased production. Okay, the, uh, the difference between, you know, uh, your conventional oven that you have at home that uh, doesn't have a fan in it versus, you know, a double stack Vulcan convection oven uh, is pretty significant. You know, if you're making baked goods, you're gonna really see a huge, huge increase in production in a commercial bakery uh, outfit. Uh, and then storage, you know, it's important not, not to forget about storage. It's often the last thing uh, that producers uh, consider, but uh, most commercial kitchen facilities are going to offer dry, cooler, and frozen storage, uh, which obviously is going to help extend shelf life uh, and decreases the likelihood of contamination uh, of products, okay? So it's, it's one thing to be able to produce your stuff and produce your products, um, in a commercial kitchen, but uh, having a place to store that stuff is, is really important as well. And one thing I will mention here, and I didn't mention this at the top, uh, everyone, but there's going to be, uh, I think, good, a good amount of time for questions here at the end if we don't get to any something during the presentation. Um, one thing I do want to mention uh, is that once you start processing, because I don't think this is in my slides, but once you do start processing in a commercial kitchen, uh, those products must also be stored in a licensed warehouse, okay? Most, most shared use kitchens, their storage space is licensed, so you can store it there. 
Um, otherwise, you would have to look at, you know, I have people, I have farmers, we have farmers down here in Athens County who would get their garage licensed by ODA as a warehouse, right? The Department of Ag will show up, they'll pay their $50 annual fee. Um, and as long as, you know, if they're storing stuff in a cooler and it's maintaining a good temperature and, you know, there's no signs of pests or anything, uh, that works out just fine. That works out just fine. So that uh, I do want to say here up front that that could be, could be an option for on farm or on at home storage. All right, so a few slides here just to get uh, a little bit into the nature of shared use kitchens. Um, you know, what are they? Uh, why, what value do they provide? You know, there's different terms that are flown, uh, kind of thrown around. So I wanna break that down for you guys before we dive too far into uh, what ACENET does as a shared use kitchen. Uh, so there's two general types of shared use kitchen models. Uh, one being a commissary kitchen uh, and one being an incubator kitchen. Okay, and I'll break down here in the next slide a little bit about what those two things are. So com uh, commissary kitchen uh, usually gives more of a bare bones approach, right? Basically you rent out kitchen time, equipment and storage. Um, there's little to no business incubation services offered. You get in there, you make your stuff and you get out, right? Uh, and this is great. This is great fit for a lot of businesses out there. The, the example that I gave in this picture and what you see a lot of in more uh, metropolitan areas uh, is food truck commissaries, right? There's a lot of commissary kitchens uh, in places like Columbus uh, that cater almost specifically to food trucks, um, but they're not there to provide a lot of business assistance. Just kind of do what you got to do here. You know, we'll charge you for uh, for your usage and storage and whatnot. Uh, caterers as well, um, and then just experienced business owners. You know, maybe there's folks out there who aren't looking for sort of some of those wraparound services. Uh, they just want to have access to a kitchen and call it a day. Okay, so commissary kitchens are very helpful for those types of businesses. Uh, incubator kitchens are just more resource laden. Okay, and this is probably um, what we'd identify ACENET as, uh, is, is an incubator kitchen. Um, you know, we provide wraparound services to our clients, uh, business development assistance, business counseling. Uh, we try to be sort of the link or the connector to retail markets. So helping them access those markets. Uh, we provide training opportunities uh, as uh, you all are experiencing here this evening. Uh, and then all this in addition to the production resources that are offered in a commissary kitchen, right? So it's taking that basics of the foundation of a, of a production space, uh, allowing businesses to use it, uh, but also wrapping in all those other things that, um, especially for a new business, a startup business who has no idea what they're doing, um, you know, kind of providing as many services as we can in-house uh, and whatever we can't provide from our own staff, uh, sort of acting as that community connector and knowing who can help out for other things, insurance, you know, funding, things like that. Uh, we don't have to go over all this, but just a couple other, a few other additional shared kitchen models. Uh, food hubs, that might be a model that you've heard of before. Uh, these typically act more as uh, aggregation or distribution centers for locally processed food. Uh, sometimes they do feature a kitchen or processing area. Uh, and they are often agriculture or farmer focused. Uh, food innovation centers, these are uh, much larger facilities that uh, offer a spectrum of things like food science, education, technology. Uh, oftentimes these are associated or affiliated with universities uh, and they will often provide technical uh, scientific assistance as well, shelf life testing, nutritional analysis and market research. Uh, and an, event, an example of this would be SIFT up in the Toledo area. Um, the Center for Innovative Food Technologies, I think that stands for, uh, would be considered a food innovation center. Uh, accelerators uh, or short, are short-term programs that are designed to help businesses with high growth potential. Uh, a lot of these uh, are linked to some kind of existing uh, food business. The examples I give there at the bottom are Chobani and Lando Lakes. They each have their own accelerators, kitchens, but it's also access to industry leaders. Um, and a lot of the accelerators take equity stakes in the companies, but also invest in those businesses as well. They're very competitive to get into them. Uh, and then finally, the last one here is something that we've uh, seen a lot um, starting probably 10 years ago, but really picking up in the last five and specifically three years because of the pandemic. Uh, but that's these restaurant incubators slash ghost kitchens, right? So these are basically restaurant spaces that are offered uh, on like a short-term or pop-up basis. Um, and then the ghost kitchen concept 
uh, are these delivery only restaurants that provide a low cost licensed commercial space, right? So the way these are set up, there's a couple of them in Columbus, uh, is that it's like a large warehouse and a bunch of individual small kitchens within the warehouse where people set up their quote unquote restaurants, right? And then you as a consumer will have a link to all the menus that are inside that warehouse and you can place your order. Food will get, usually get delivered to you if you want or pick up. Um, so it's a pretty cool concept. I think we'll be seeing more of that. Uh, but when you hear that, this is all just to let you know, when you hear that term shared use kitchen, it really does cover a lot of different things. Okay, so a brief history of the ACENET Food Venture Center. Uh, so the ACENET Food Venture Center was one of the first of its kind in the country. When I say first of its kind, I mean like a rural kitchen incubator. There weren't many uh, in existence. Um, the original staff members, some of the founders of ACENET, uh, toured some of the existing kitchen incubators in the US and places like Oregon and California uh, before developing that model and bringing it back to Athens. Uh, fundraising started in 1992, uh, 95, the initial, the original property was purchased uh, and opened in 96, where there was right off the bat, there was about 40 businesses lined up to use it uh, because there had been such a kind of period of, of building uh, excitement around this project. Uh, and then 99 was phase two, where a warehouse was added on to the existing um, infrastructure, the existing kitchen. Uh, ACENET originally started in 1985 as a worker-owned network, uh, becoming regionally focused in 1990. Uh, and the original work of ACENET was uh, supporting worker-owned businesses, co-ops, right? Casa Nueva and Crumbs Bakery being two examples of that, uh, and two businesses that are still in existence today uh, and still do work out of ACENET. Um, initial strengths were in production, direct marketing, uh, and some restaurant wholesale markets. Uh, limited infrastructure existed except by some innovative and organic farmers uh, for pack houses. Uh, there was over 1.4 million in capital investments needed to make the Food Venture Center a uh, reality. And that's in, you know, early mid 90s dollars. So today you can uh, imagine where that lines up. So it definitely took a lot of investment and it was outside funding, but also uh, some additional funding and, and uh, donations that they got to the finish line to build out the Food Venture Center. Uh, so today, the Food Venture Center uh, consists of three processing facilities and one storage area. Uh, the central processing kitchen uh, is the space that ha has the greatest diversity of products and businesses. It is sort of the, uh, say, like the heart of the ACENET Food Venture Center. Uh, the thermal processing room has the greatest volume of products that come out of it. So in terms of sheer production, uh, the thermal processing room kind of takes that mantle. Uh, the dry packaging room is an is a auxiliary space that is primarily used for packaging dry goods. Uh, and then we have our warehouse, obviously, which is required uh, to allow our users to uh, dry or store dry foods, uh, cooler uh, refrigerated foods and frozen foods, um, and also as a distribution access point uh, for things that are both being delivered and shipped out. All right, here it is, 96. Here's the central processing kitchen uh, in its first year of operation. Uh, this gentleman here is named Rick Wasserman and he had a business called World's Best Bagels. Uh, this is him churning up some of his cream cheese. So these are their early days, the halcyon days of the Athens Food Venture Center. Um, it's hard to tell here. I wish there was more of these pictures that existed, uh, but it, you know, it looks like they were definitely still figuring things out, right? Everything is kind of uh, spread out and, and moved around a bit and uh, maybe not in the best shape or the best order. Um, and this is the central processing kitchen today. This actually isn't even, yeah, we should get more up-to-date pictures. This is a few years ago. We have brand new floors in there now, but um, this can kind of give you a sense of what this space looks like. Uh, and this is, again, this is designed, we hear that phrase shared use kitchen. This particular space is really designed for the shared use concept where we can have uh, two, three, even four businesses all working in this space uh, at the same time, uh, simultaneously side by side. Uh, one of my jobs is kind of the coordinator of this space uh, is having a good understanding uh, of what equipment people are going to be using, how many people they're bringing in. Uh, so that way we are sort of uh, handling any conflicts before they happen. Um, so we, uh, we do a good job of that. Uh, and it's a, it's a constant battle to make that, to make that work. All right, so uh, we found 
back to value adding early on, one of the biggest value added type style products being made were thermal process products. Okay. When we say thermal processing, uh, it's just a fancy way of saying uh, you are reducing the amount of pathogens through heat, right? Uh, so in our case, that's making jarred products, things like barbecue sauce, salsa, uh, salad dressings, chutneys, hot sauce, um, and putting it into a jar. Uh, and as long as you follow the right steps, it's a shelf stable product. So uh, that stuff was being made in the central kitchen alongside everything else. Uh, but based on the uh, demand to expand production uh, of those types of products. Uh, in 2015, there was another large, um, another large addition made to our production uh, facility by building out a dedicated thermal processing room. Uh, so here you can see some of that process taking place, uh, installing a trench drain, uh, this beautiful molded floor that was installed. Uh, and then a lot of the equipment that was initially purchased, a few steam kettles and a bottling line. Uh, and then here it is, here it is today. So uh, as it exists today, uh, there are now four steam kettles in our thermal processing room, totaling about 350 gallons uh, of volume uh, within those four kettles. Uh, there's a fully dedicated bottling line, uh, a capping machine, there's a pump system that can pump directly from the kettles uh, to the fill machine. Uh, and there's some auxiliary equipment to help uh, with the process uh, as well. So uh, it's been a, Oh, my headphones might've went out there. Hold, so hold on, you guys. <clears throat> yeah, you're good. Good. All right. Uh, so thermal processing space, um, this has really been our biggest draw to clients, to businesses who already have some kind of, um, you know, production uh, standard in place and are looking for a place to, you know, Kind of expand what they're already doing uh, but it's also a great place for local farmers who want to make a big batch of applesauce right and they come in you know one day maybe twice a year and they're able to make you know 50 100 gallons of applesauce in one day of work uh, so we're very grateful for that space and uh, it's a really important part of what we can offer to the community so meat processing meat processing was another thing that we had a lot of demand for uh, at ASNET, one thing that we try to do is always listen uh, to the people who uh, who use our space and who are making food in our region. Uh, so the demand for meat inspected meat processing was something that kept coming back up uh, for, for many years. Uh, the current and what I think is pretty common, uh, not just in Ohio, but across the country uh, in rural areas. But, you know, we only have really two existing meat processors in our region uh, that are within any kind of reasonable driving distance their way, right? There's not a lot of, um, not a lot of space for, uh, we'll say, uh, customization, right? So your, like Farmer John's product, so on and so forth. Um, so from our perspective, we thought, how can we help provide value to help fill this gap or fill this need? Okay. So uh, funding, again, as usual, funding is always the together to make this happen. Um, well, you're able to do that with uh, both some regional and, uh, and statewide partners uh, to begin building out a fully dedicated meat processing space, secondary facility. In Nelsonville, Ohio, about 20 minutes up the road from Athens. Uh, that facility um, is a 100,000 square foot warehouse. So there's plenty of space. Uh, and the basic idea was to build out a processing room within that warehouse. Okay, so construction began uh, in 2017. Uh, we started buying equipment, vacuum sealers, saws, prep tables. Uh, and then we were able to open that facility uh, in 2018. Okay, so this is our first production run that we had up there. It's a business called Farm on the Ridge. Uh, they make all kinds of tasty sausages and bacon and, and treats. Um, but it's, again, it was a way for us to offer something that was different than what existed, uh, but there was specialized demand uh, behind it uh, as well. So we're really excited about the future of that space. All right. 
So now we'll go ahead and get a little bit into some of the more regulatory um, inner workings of the regulatory side of this. I know that's what you all are probably most curious about. You know, how does all this relate uh, to what I want to do, or maybe you're considering uh, value-added production. Um, so first, what we see here is kind of a list that I spelled out of common value-added processing options for for farmers. All right, and I've broken it down into four different uh, sort of realms: FDA thermal processing. Okay, so again, making those charred shelf-stable products, inspected meat processing, adding value to livestock uh, or meat products, uh, minimal produce processing, right? So taking your produce, finding a way to add value to it through minimal uh, processing means. And then finally, something that we've seen more uh, an uptick up in, of in recent years is dietary supplement production. Okay, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on each of these. Okay, so FDA thermal processing. Registration and inspection oversight belongs to FDA. Okay, so anytime we are making what we call acidified or low acid products, so these are foods that uh, do not naturally have the amount of acid in them for them to be considered shelf stable, uh, those product processes must be registered with FDA. Uh, in our region, because we do not have access to a lot of FDA inspectors, the FDA actually contracts ODA, which is the Ohio Department of Agriculture, and uses their inspectors to conduct the inspections, review documents, and assist with label review. Okay, so that we're actually kind of fortunate because um, our ODA inspector handles pretty much everything else as well. Uh, so we have that kind of con con continuity or consistency uh, of regulation. Uh, all production runs, if you're doing thermal processing, require that an individual is certified in what's called better process controls. Okay, uh, better process controls is typically a two or three day class uh, that is offered in person uh, at Ohio State University. It's also offered online uh, through universities like North Carolina State and a few others. Uh, but if you're going to be making these types of products and you need to take that class and have that certification, uh, shelf, stable, shelf stable products uh, must re also receive what's called a process authority letter or a PA letter. Uh, this is basically an expert, an expert in the uh, area of food safety. You send them a sample of your product, they do an analysis on it, and they send you back a letter and tell you these, this is how you have to make your product to make it safe, right? So usually it's a is keep it there for five minutes, you know, test the pH, uh, put it into a, uh, into a jar, just test the temperature again. Um, and as long as you hit all those steps, then you should be fine. I'm going to turn my headphones off here, you guys. I'm trying to talk to my headphone mic, and it keeps dying. Uh, so can you all, you all can still hear me, correct? Okay, getting two thumbs up. Very good. All right. Um, so some product examples, again, pasta sauce, salsa, barbecue sauce, hot sauce, salad dressing, things like that. Um, these are typical of what we see a lot of at ASNA. You know, people who are making these types of products. Uh, and they want to use a thermal processing room to expand production. All right, meat processing. So there's a lot of text here on this screen because meat processing uh, has a lot of red tape around it. I'm going to do my best to keep it simple. Um, but if you decide that you want to pursue fully inspected meat processing, uh, you're likely looking at one of two options, state inspection, or federal inspection. Now, state inspection for us here in Ohio is through the Ohio Department of Agriculture. Uh, federal inspection is always through USDA. Okay, now the pros of state inspection is that you typically, especially in rural areas, are going to have better access to inspectors and more flexibility of scheduling. The pros to a federal inspection is that you can ship across state lines and there's some, sometimes there's added consumer appeal. appeal. Some people like to see the USDA uh, kind of seal on their products, right? Um, now, there is one more option that we have here in Ohio uh, and a few other states as well, uh, which is called the FSIS Cooperative Interstate Shipment Program. Uh, and what this is, uh, this is a program that allows state inspected facilities to essentially operate as federally inspected facilities and ship their products in interstate commerce. Uh, Ohio is fortunate to be one of nine states that participate in this program. Um, we went through the process of becoming a CIS facility, uh, which means folks can now make stuff at ACENET uh, and ship it over to West Virginia or PA 
uh, or Indiana, which was uh, something that, you know, our clients had interest in. Um, but it took a few steps to get there. It took a few steps to get there. Okay. Uh, so some other requirements, uh, facilities must have approved HACCP plans. Uh, so HACCP is hazard analysis critical control point. Um, they must have HACCP plans for dedicated processes, some examples being raw ground, raw intact, or fully cooked shelf stable products. Uh, but basically these plans are just step-by-step, -step, uh, very detailed, written out um, food safety plans for every single step involved from you know, receiving your packaging materials uh, to testing your product for E. coli and sort of tests and sort of every little step in between figuring out what are the areas that I have to be most concerned about, right? So they're, they're pretty intensive to write, uh, but once you do have them approved uh, and you typically work with your inspector on that, uh, they're great and they make a lot of sense. You know, they really do kind of cover all the bases. Uh, but some product examples here are sausage, jerky, steaks, and marinated cuts. Now, the other option that you have and sort of the space that ACE that operated in before we built out uh, an inspected meat processing facility uh, is what we call the retail exemption. Must be processing in a commercial kitchen. Uh, you must start with product that has already been inspected, right? So if you receive um, a box of beef, it has to come from an inspected facility. Um, the product must be sold. That's a typo. I should say product. Product must be sold directly to the end user. This is the most important piece, okay? So you cannot do any wholesale, right? Uh, and that uh, limit is 25% of total sales uh, of the processor's total sales, not to exceed $100,000. Um, also, these products cannot be sold, obviously, across state lines. Okay, so we're definitely getting into the regulatory weeds on this one. But if you are considering doing any meat processing, I think this is a really, really great option uh, for anybody who's just starting out, especially if you see yourself focusing on farmers markets restaurants and really aren't aren't interested in pursuing some of those larger wholesale accounts. Grease convenience for consumers. Okay. Uh, the licensing, the registration and inspection oversight for these products typically belongs to the Department of Ag. Uh, some examples of this include wash and bag produce, uh, cut and pack, uh, IQF or individual quick freezing, uh, dehydration. Uh, these processes may help increase selling opportunities to wholesale buyers, uh, places like schools and hospitals. Uh, and they also allow for greater branding identity. Okay, it's better to, from a consumer's perspective, you're more likely to, to have a good shelf space if you present your product in a nice package with a cool brand, a cool logo on it, a nice sticker. Uh, but some examples of these types of products include bag lettuce, boxed cut squash, frozen diced potatoes, and dehydrated mushrooms. All right, dietary supplement production. Uh, so the licensing, registration, and inspection oversight for these products belongs to FDA. Uh, we've seen noticeable growth in this sector, especially in CBD and hemp products, uh, as that became uh, CBD products became legal to produce uh, in Ohio in the last few years. Um, they can be produced in uh, any FDA licensed commercial kitchen. Uh, labeling requirements are the same as FDA food labeling. Uh, the products must include this product has not been tested by FDA. That statement must be on there on the label. Uh, if you do make any nutritional claims on the product, they must have some kind of justification. Uh, and some examples of these types of products are things like tinctures, balms, and salves. 
Uh, one important note here, and I just kind of added this, I know it's, they're not technically dietary supplements, but sort of in the same realm. Uh, cosmetics, however, can be made at home. So things like soaps, uh, lotions, shampoo, stuff like that. You can make that stuff at home. That's no problem whatsoever. So that's a nice little, nice little thing to know if you are considering doing any of that. All right. So this is typically probably one of the most helpful slides as part of this uh, presentation. Um, happy to send this out to whoever would like to look at it in further depth. Uh, but basically, I just put together a chart uh, that sources and sort of tracks. This is your process. This is the regulatory agency that you'll be working with. OK, uh, so I'm not going to go over all of them uh, here right now. Uh, a couple of things that I will point out for those of us on the call that are from Ohio. Um, you know, down here at the bottom, specifically with the dairy processing and meat processing, uh, there are some times where you get connected uh, to one of the agencies that are pointed out here, and they determine whether or not they are going to regulate your product. And if not, that product will be typically kicked back to the Ohio Department of Ag Division of Food Safety, which is the second one down here, okay? So Division of Food Safety oversees a ton of different stuff, okay? Uh, there's sort of like a catch-all for all the stuff that these more specific departments or divisions don't want to handle, right? So there are some products, whether it's based on the amount that you're producing, um, you know, the uh, something specific about the way that you make your product, uh, that maybe the Division of Dairy says, you know what, we're not going to regulate that. We're going to kick that back to the Division of Food Safety. Okay, so that could happen. Uh, but the first person you would always contact if you were doing any dairy processing would be someone at ODA Division of Dairy or at FDA. Okay, so I just want to make that little by note for you all. Um, but this chart, I think, does a pretty good job of sort of putting together some of the pieces of that puzzle. All right, what about on-farm processing? What if you are considering building out a production space uh, on your farm or on your property? Uh, so these are the requirements. These are requirements for a commercial kitchen. It's kind of some standard requirements. Uh, you need a hand wash sink. You need a place to wash hands. Uh, you need potable water, right? If it's well water, it must be tested annually, okay? Uh, you need a wear washing sink so it, or a dishwashing sink could be a different phrase for that. And it must be set up appropriately so that you can wash, rinse, and sanitize. All surfaces must be cleanable. And I know what, what does cleanable mean? So that's one of those words that's very much uh, going to be at the inspector's uh, inter interpretation. But generally what it means is non-porous, smooth, and durable. Okay. Um, that also speaks not just to, uh, you know, your, your food contact services, but also your walls, your ceilings, and your floors, okay? Um, all equipment must be usable, and there's that word again, cleanable. Uh, and the facility should also be free of leaks, pets, pets, and pests. Pets and pests, okay. All right, so if we're looking at on-farm processing, we might also be looking at doing some produce processing uh, and maybe looking at GAP certification as well. Uh, so by no means am I an expert uh, on GAP, uh, but I do know a little bit about it. And I kind of spelled that out as best I could here on this slide. Uh, so by GAP, we mean good agricultural practices. Uh, this was a phrase that was introduced through FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act, uh, under the Produce Safety Rule. It is a voluntary program, so it is not required. Uh, but it does verify sound food safety practices are being used on a farm or produce handling facility through a third party audit. Okay, so you do need to hire a third party to come out and do uh, do your gap, uh, do your gap certification um, audit. Uh, there might be some nonprofits in your area that offer that service as well. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think rural action does or used to do something like that. Maybe gap training is what they did. Um, Many retailers actually require GAP certification to sell produce, especially the larger retailers, uh, your Kroger's and such, uh, may require GAP certification to sell your products um, within their stores. Uh, and it has a dual benefit of ensuring safe food 
and expanding access uh, to market. So I think if it is within your means, uh, and if you're at a level where you're considering, you know, what can I do to uh, kind of expand my retail options, uh, then GAP certification is worth looking into. All right, now here is a list of licenses and fees, okay? Now all the fees and licenses that you see here uh, are through ODA, so through the Ohio Department of Ag. Uh, so standard registration, uh, this is for anyone uh, who, is, who has a processing facility or warehouse, okay? And this starts at $50 and goes up, okay? And it goes up based on square footage. That's all that is. So if you exceed... Oh, I want to say it's 2,500 square feet. I don't know the exact number, but it starts going up at some point. Um, you know, if you have a standard kind of small commercial kitchen operation, it's not going to be more than 50 bucks. Uh, but beyond that, you'll, you'll be looking at other registration fees if you're more, doing more specialized things. So a cannery license. So we go back to thermal processing. If you're making any canned foods, that is a $200 annual fee. Uh, the milk processor license is $15 through the uh, Division of Dairy. The frozen food license is a $50 fee. Wholesale bakery license is $30 and up, again, depending on square footage. Home bakery license is $10. Syrup and extract license is $100. Uh, and then for meat processing, it's going to be $100 no matter what license you get. Uh, but there are three different license options. You have your custom operator license. You have your fully inspected operator license uh, and your voluntary inspection license for if you're doing any exotic animal processing. But one note I'll mention here, you guys, is the home bakery license. So home bakery license is actually different than cottage foods. Uh, so home bakery means you are inviting an inspector into your house to do an inspection, okay? Uh, they're gonna check for things like, do you have any pets? You cannot have any pets in your house if you're going to have a home bakery license. Um, but you pay $10 uh, and it does allow you to uh, make things like breads or pastries that have some hazardous ingredients like dairy and stuff in them. So it does allow you to kind of expand what your options are for only 10 bucks a year. All right. So we're going to, I think this is the last kind of little section that I have here before we get to some questions. Uh, but we're going to close out talking about what I think is probably one of the most confusing, but also most important pieces of the regulatory puzzle, which is labeling, product labeling, okay? Uh, so here is a graphic that I think very clearly and simply uh, kind of spells out the requirements of a product label. Uh, you have your uh, front of your label, which we call the principal display panel. Uh, it includes the statement of identity, which is the name of your product, and the net quantity statement, uh, which is the weight of your product. Uh, and then on the back, we have the information panel, Okay, which could include a number of things, which I'll get into in the next slide here. Um, so these are the requirements. These are this is everything that you need, uh, according to the FDA labeling guide, to be on a food product. Okay, uh, so you need the common name of the product. Uh, for example, if you have a, a spicy salsa, make sure the word salsa is in there so people know that it's salsa. Uh, you need to have your business slash manufacturer name you know, the name of your business or manufacturer, a brand identifier. You must have a net quantity statement, as we saw in the picture here, right? That's the net weight, you know, listed in ounces and grams, but it also, it has to be standard and metric. That's the key. It's got to be both standard and metric. Uh, you must, must, must have an ingredient statement, which lists all the ingredients in the sending order by uh, that must also, what we call the sub ingredients. Okay. The sub ingredients uh, or for example, if we have butter as an ingredient in a pie that we're making, it would say butter, and then in parentheses, it would say cream, um, you know, whatever else is in the particular butter that you use. Okay. So you basically add that into it. Um, allergens must be clearly stated. Uh, so the eight major allergens, uh, according to FDA, are wheat, dairy, soy, fish, shellfish, eggs, peanuts, and tree nuts. So if your product has any of those ingredients in it, it must be clearly stated on the label. Uh, and then finally, it must also have your business information, including the address, name, and business name, and phone number. All right, so these are all the minimum required elements that must be on every food product label. Uh, and here's another graphic that really gets into more 
detail on all that, okay? All right, a few more notes on labeling. Uh, so you might've noticed on that last slide that you see nutrition facts panel, uh, or what we call NFPs. Uh, so those are actually not required uh, unless you are making nutritional claims. Like if you say your product is fat-free, or if you say your product has 100% daily value of vitamin C, then you have to have a nutritional facts panel backing that up. Um, same goes if you sell a million dollars or more of that product. You must also have a nutritional panel. Okay? Uh, UPCs are barcodes. They are highly recommended if you plan on selling to large retailers or institutions. Uh, there's a website called gs1.org that we send most of our clients to who are looking to purchase UPC codes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Codge Food Labels must contain this product is home produced. Uh, and meat product labels must include a state or federal stamp of approval with the corresponding establishment number. Uh, so what you see there on the right is the actual template that we use for all meat products at ASNET. All right, so it's got the Ohio uh, seal there at the top and our establishment number. Uh, they must also include the safe handling instructions, which you see there as well. And you probably have seen many times on any meat product. So as we close out this discussion uh, on labeling, um, some things that I just have to say, uh, get on my high horse here a little bit, uh, because I, I tell people this over and over again, um, and I think, it's, I think it's so, so important. Anytime I'm working with a new business, uh, and that's work with a professional graphic designer and a professional printer, right? Especially if you're really trying to get your product into stores that are maybe outside of your local area. Um, you might have the best salsa in the world, but if it's sitting there on a store shelf and there's another product next to it that has a more appealing label, the consumer doesn't know any better, right? So do not cut yourself short when it comes to the presentation uh, of the label, of the packaging of your product. Uh, it should be clean, creative, concise. Uh, it should show personality and tell a story. Uh, and when you're sourcing packaging, consider both appearance and suitability to the product does it keep the product fresh right um and also consider your packaging when you're actually having the labels when the labels printed so all this is to say this is the one area where it's like outsource your work you know i know we all have access to things like canva and whatnot but um you know seek out a professional have them help you with that part of it you know if you don't have any of this experience yourself it's really a good idea to just um step out and find someone who can kind of carry you across the finish line from a branding and design perspective. Uh, okay, so here's some examples here as well. So some good examples. Uh, this product here at the top actually was made at AceNet, Ted's Pepper Butter. Uh, we had a designer who worked with him on these labels. It, it told a great story, it presented well, um, and it had some good kind of factors to it that would vary depending on the flavor. Um, and there's some examples here at the bottom that I found online that I thought were pretty unique, pretty cool, you know, just kind of stood out uh, as different. Um, but also not overwhelming. Uh, and then we have some not good examples here of labels. One of these was made at ASNET. Um, and, you know, it's just, there's things that we can do and we can control. Uh, you know, we might make a great product. Like I said, it tastes really good. Um, but uh, when it comes to the packaging, the labeling, um, don't try and do it yourself uh, because this is what could happen. And with that, we will pass it along to questions and discussion. Adam, it looks like you've got at least one question from Michelle in the chat. Michelle, do you want to go ahead and ask that? Okay, so um, at the end, you were talking about inspection in the home. I do. Uh, I'm a certified farmer, but I also do baked goods and I use the vegetables. I do a multi fruit, multi vegetable bread. So you mentioned, and, I, and I'm sorry, I'm at the library. So I missed your okay. last comment that you made about the inspection and how often they needed to come out and how much it cost and who would do the inspection and who would I call? Yeah, Thank you. no problem. Great question. Uh, so for the home bakery license, 
Uh, my understanding is that it's an annual fee of $10, right? So it's a very minimal investment. Um, now this, is, this is in Ohio, Michelle. I'm not sure where you're joining us from, uh, but that is handled through I'm the- I'm in Ohio. Ohio. Yeah, in Ohio. I'm in Ohio. Yeah. So that's handled through the Ohio Department of Agriculture. Um, I would expect it would be the Division of Food Safety specifically. Uh, within ODA, there's you know, 20, 30 different divisions uh, that handle food. Um, but it would likely be the Division of Food Safety. Uh, and I believe it is an, an annual inspection uh, and an annual fee. Does that answer all your questions? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so when I call them or get in touch with them, what if I'm already GAP certified and all of that? Does that matter? I would expect it would only add make things easier for you. So are you saying that you are growing produce, uh, GAP certified produce, and then you're using that produce in baked goods that you are making at your home? We're not, I don't think we're GAP, I'm part of a co-op. We're not, I don't think we're GAP certified. I, I actually received the GAP certification through the university. Okay, I see, I see. Yeah, Individually. Would, understood. Uh, that, shouldn't, that shouldn't have an impact. Um, you know, again, what's, what they're mostly looking for is just the condition of your home itself, of your kitchen, right? Uh, is it, everything look like it's in good shape? Is it being cleaned? Uh, are there animals around, pets around? That's really the biggest sticking point that I always hear over and over again is, you know, I wanted to do a home baking license, uh, but I had pets in the house and I couldn't do anything about that. Um, so yeah, that's what stuck out the most to me, but uh, from what I've heard, it's it's really a pretty simple process. It's just, you know, like most things these days, Michelle, I don't know if you've had these experiences, but um, the hardest thing seems to be just uh, getting somebody out there, you know, and you got to kind of got to keep reaching out to them and stay on top of them and, and get on their schedule. Because once you do and get out there and, and pay the fee, um, most of the work is done, fortunately. Also, um, you were showing the labels, the product labels is a, is it ACS or AES? Do you actually do, um, is that one of your services that you do labels for individuals who are selling um, products? Yes, yes. I don't uh, do that myself. We have somebody on staff named Delia, uh, who is our multimedia uh, design expert. Uh, okay. works with our clients on um, designing labels, logos, um, brochures. Uh, what I what I do, how I do contribute to that process is I can make I can manufacture NFPs, nutritional facts panels, uh, okay, for products. If you are interested in having that as part of your label, um, yeah. And I basically I just review once she has done the initial work on the label. What I do is review, uh, you know is this in compliance before we send it to the state for final review? Okay, and I'm sure it's a fee. So how, how would we get in touch with Delia? <laughs> we can probably, Bailey, we can probably provide uh, a, an email introduction or just provide her information in the chat or email okay. address. Well, the best way would be to handle that. But yeah, we can definitely connect you to, uh, to Delia. Um, and get you an intake form. There will need to be an intake form filled out so we can set you up for billing and all that. Um, okay. But yeah, that'd Thank be great. You. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Mm -hmm. where, where are you? Whereabouts are you, Michelle? I'm in Dayton. Dayton, okay, it, cool. Yep. Great, thanks for joining us tonight. All right. Yeah, Shane, go ahead. I had a couple of questions. I'll start with like probably the quickest, easiest one. Okay. If you were doing like a product, like a value added product such as like um, elderberry syrup, would that fall under the dietary supplement category? Yes. Cool, that was the quick, easy one. Yep. Uh, the next question is, um, uh, AceNet, am I correct? They have a location in Athens and one in Nelsonville. Are those like the two, or is there more? Just that, just those two, just those two. We have our cool. again, the, we call it Food Ventures Center in Athens, 
uh, and then the food food and farm enterprise center in Nelsonville. Um, each of them kind of have their own processing strengths and weaknesses, I guess you could say, depending on what you would be interested in using them for. Um, okay. But again, not sure where you're calling, where you're joining us from here today, Shane. Uh, one resource I will mention, and I'll put it in the chat, uh, it's called The Kitchen Door. Uh, and The Kitchen Door is a website uh, that you can go to. Uh, it is hosted by a company called The Food Corridor, where you can put in your, um, you know, your zip code or the city that you're located in, and it will basically give you a list of what are the nearest kitchens to where I'm at, share these kitchens cool. to where I'm at. So I do want to mention that resource as well. And uh, my last question is, how does um, ACENET operate in the sense of, is it like a membership fee? Like you pay like a monthly or an annual fee, or is it depending on how much space you're going to be using or how frequently you're going to be there? Yep. So we have an initial intake fee uh, that uh, folks will pay to start receiving our services. Um, but after that, everything is billed based on usage, right? Uh, so if you're actually working in the kitchen, uh, you are billed in, on an hourly basis, depending on what you're doing. We have different rates. If you're if you're using like the thermal processing room, we're going to charge more versus if you're using, you know, an oven in the central kitchen. Um, uh, and then for storage as well, we, we charge uh, by the pallet space if you're uh, booking any dry storage. Uh, and then we charge by the square foot for cooler uh, and freezer storage. Um, and we have... We'll send you, I don't know what you put it in the chat here, Bailey, but we have a list of all of our prices online for all of our service fees and whatnot. So, yep, good question. All right, anybody else? Okay. Uh, well, thank you all for joining this evening. Um, I appreciate your time. Uh, I know it's a, it's a lot of information and kind of a condensed, uh, a tight hour. So we're going to, we're going to send this slide, this slideshow out to you all uh, to review. Um, but uh, my contact information, which I had in the last slide, I'll put in the chat here as well. Uh, if you all do have any questions, do not hesitate uh, to reach out about ACENET services um, about regulatory assistance, uh, whatever it might be. And uh, I'd be happy to, uh, be happy to guide you further. You want to take, take us out here, Bailey? Yeah. If nobody has any other questions, um, thank you for joining us and we hope you make it to more of these in the whole farm planning series. Have a good night, everybody. Have a great night. Good night, y'all. Thank you. Thank y'all.